and welcome to Nonprofits Mean Business 2, where we delve into services provided in our community by nonprofit organizations. I am your volunteer host, Krista Stadler, joined by Dina Dre, the Executive Director of the Diamond Head Theater. Welcome, Dina. Thank you. Thank you. Joining nice us. Great to be here. Lots of, lots of things to talk to you about, and I, I know that you've been with the, the theater a long time. I'd love to hear how you connected with, how did this position even come about and some of your experiences? Sure, so I was on the board of the theater and I have been a volunteer at other theaters around um, the town and the community. And um, they were looking for a person to step into the executive director position. And I was in the midst of looking for another job opportunity. I was with the Health and Human Service nonprofit and it was winding down and moving into a different direction. And so I told the board that to keep an eye out for jobs for me, gave them my resume and they said, what about this job? So it was pretty <laughs> absolutely fortuitous um, that I was kind of in the right place at the right time. And being on the board for five years, I was familiar with the organization. I knew the staff, I knew the volunteers, I knew the board. So it did position me well, um, but I will say that if you're on a board and you walk into a position as a staff person, it is absolutely completely different. Absolutely completely different. So, <laughs> you think imagine. it's going to be the same. You think it's going to be, you're, you know it, you understand it, but it's, it's really an eye opener to be an executive director in a nonprofit versus a board member. So. Yeah. So what were some of your, I mean, I don't think people really understand what encompasses operating a community theater. What, are some, what were some of the things that you maybe had to come in and take care of and, and operationally change or fix over the years? Well, for the first part, we were in a financial struggle at that point. So this was 25 years ago and we were um, running in the red and we were struggling to find our brand and maintain our identity and keep our customers. And um, when I came in, I knew I had a big job ahead of me because I loved the theater. I had been attending as a board member and as a patron, but I, um, I knew that we had a lot of work to do. So we kind of sat down and looked at how we could grow the theater. And I hired our artistic director, John Rampage, on a tiny little thousand dollar a month budget because um, we had no money. And um, he and I kind of carved out an identity for the theater and we regained people's trust. People then knew what they were getting when they came to Diamond Head Theater. They knew what our brand was. They knew what they could expect when the curtain went up. So it was, it was, you know, really good. It was, it was a good thing to do. I just had a fly fly right into my mouth. <laughs> Live television. <laughs> was the format then as far as the number of shows that you put on a year and uh, your volunteer base and, and things like that, was it the same when you started or has that changed? It, it was the same. Actually, we did seven shows. We do six now. Um, we did seven then. I'd like to get back to seven, actually. So it was um, five musicals and two plays. And now we do the um, four musicals and one play. Um, but... And Five, five and one, sorry, I kind of out of my head. So it was, the repertoire was similar, but I think we pointed it in a different direction. So we made sure that we were living up to our mission statement. We, we call ourselves the Broadway of the Pacific and it's a little grand. I mean, let's face it, we're not Broadway, but we certainly like people to have that vision in their minds. So they understand when they walk in the door here, they are going to see what is on Broadway on a smaller scale. So for the people who can't go to New York and can't experience theater on Broadway, we want to be that to them. So that getting to that position and getting people to understand that was kind of our core brand that we were gonna be Broadway musical based. And there are other theaters in town that do different things um, and they do a wonderful job. So what's been nice in this community to me is we all know our lane and we all know our specialty so that people who enjoy theater have a wide range of theater opportunities here and we're not stepping on each other's toes by doing the same type of work. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Do you, um, when you have downtimes between your productions, do you rent the theater out to, to other folks that are interested in using it? 
We do, we do. Um, it's challenging because we do have a situation where we have our own shows, we rehearse on stage, we're building the set on stage. So it's not like we have a lot of time to rent, but we do. Um, we rent to the Gridiron. A lot of people are familiar with the theater because of the Gridiron show um, put on by the so Society of Professional Journalists. And we rent to schools, high schools come and pre perform productions here. We rent to other nonprofits. But again, time is difficult because our theater pretty much runs year round. So we open our season in September and we close our last show at the end of August. So there's not much downtime between shows that the stage and the theater itself isn't being utilized. And for a, 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 a normal production, what is the lead time as far as, um, you know, you're, you're doing your auditions and then your set building and rehearsals up to the show date. What, tell us about the lead time involved. It's about, it's about six to eight weeks. So auditions start maybe eight weeks before the show and um, then rehearsals run for about six weeks and then the show itself runs for about four weeks. So there's a big that chunk is... of time involved and that's why it takes up so much of our time here because there's a lot going on all the time. So while the cast is rehearsing and again, our casts are volunteers so they have real jobs. So they go and work all day and then they come here and rehearse till 10 or 11 o'clock at night, which is pretty amazing. Um, yeah. While they're doing that during the day, our staff costume shop are building and sewing costumes. The sheen shop is building the sets. So there's a lot that goes into a production before the curtain goes up. And of all of the, other than the folks on the stage, the backstage support, the folks making the costumes, the lighting and sound people during all of this rehearsal time, are those paid employees or are those uh, volunteers as well? The majority of volunteers. We have a core staff, so we have a costume shop with two employees. We have a scene shop with three employees, but everything else is done by volunteers. So they come in, the people who run the lights, who run the sound, um, all of that are, are volunteers. All of those are volunteers. That's amazing. And they're trained well enough to do that as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, fo do you train them? Do you get them we do. trained? We, do. we have a core. Um, so for building the sets, obviously, we're always looking for people to help us paint and um, do elementary carpentry um, mm -hmm. for the costumes. People can come in and sew on buttons and sew on snaps and, you know, do a little bit of labeling of the costumes and ironing is always popular. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and not for me, but people do. And then for our sound and lights, um, we have a standard sound volunteer that has been working with us for several years now. She's terrific. And our lighting person is actually a staff member um, who also runs the lights. So the core skill position is fairly close to being professional, but they're surrounded by volunteers. That's just so wonderful. That's and nice. do you... When things open up again, and we're going to talk about all of that in just a minute, but when, when things open up again, are you, are you pretty much always in need or interested in folks volunteering? You know, there, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. Sometimes we need volunteers. I think there are, if, if someone wants to volunteer and get involved in the theater, the best thing to do is to contact our volunteer coordinator, and we will put you in a pool for when we need you. And there are, there is a core team who come in and help build the sets and there is a core team who help um, sew the costumes. We have a lot of people who usher and take tickets. Mm -hmm. And so there's always teams who are looking to build for that because the shows run 16 or 17 nights. So that means we need 16 or 17 different teams. We have people who, who sell snacks and mm -hmm. um, tend the bar and we're always looking for people to do those jobs. So the best thing to do if people are interested in volunteering is to contact the volunteer coordinator, and then we will ask you, what are you interested in? And we'll fit you into where we can use you best. Okay. And what, to, just out of curiosity, what was your last full production uh, prior to all the mandates hitting regarding COVID? The last show we did was Murder on the Orient Express, and okay. it was a play. It went really, really well, um, very well received. And we never thought that that was going to be our last production. So we had almost opened The Bodyguard and we were so excited about this show because it was Whitney Houston songs. And we brought in a guest, we brought in a guest artist from the mainland, this wonderful woman, and she was all ready to go. And the night before the final dress rehearsal is when the city shut down. 
So they did one final dress rehearsal for themselves and for a, a smattering of um, friends in the audience. And then we had a shutdown. And we still, even then, like everybody else, thought we were still gonna be able to do the show. So the woman stayed, she, come, she came from New York, she stayed on, we had a wonderful board member who put her up in her house and we were able to keep her here for a while and it kept moving and it kept moving and it kept moving. And then we finally said, you know, Lindsay, I think you can go home because we don't, we're not gonna do the yeah. show. And we were really yeah. stricken about that one because everybody was so excited. The show was so good and it was gonna be so much fun. I mean, you know the movie, right? So it's the yeah. movie Bodyguard and then absolutely chock full of Whitney Houston songs, so. Oh my gosh. So that was fun. really disappointing. And then it went kind of downhill from there. I mean, we had to cancel our summer show, um, our, spring, our next spring show, we had to cancel our summer show. And we've been kind of trying to struggle to maintain some sort of visibility in the community and let people know we're still around and we still are dying to come back and provide what we do, which is live theater on our stage again. Um, and so we're starting to do a little bit of that with the drive-ins now. Oh, good. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the drive-ins. Right. So I, I belong to a national organization. It's called the American Association of Community Theaters. And all across the country are theaters like mine. And we all talk all the time about what we're doing, what kind of shows we're doing. And there's a cohort that are very similar sized and we keep in touch with each, with each other all the time. And they started talking about what they were doing outside on their grounds. And each state is different and each city is different. So some of them were able to do, get up quicker and get staff back sooner than we were. So they had already started with a lot of these outdoor performances. In the meantime, we had a small task force here internally with the staff. And one of the participants in the task force, which is a former shooting star, which is our kids program. She said, why don't we do something in our parking lot? And both of those came together in what we developed to be the drive-in series. And what is really great about it is we have a ready-made space because we have a dock that hangs off the back of the theater and the staff painted the back a little bit, as you can see the stars and the, a little bit of a um, ocean scene. And we put in microphones. And what's great about this is that the sound comes in through your car and it's excellent. I'm talking the sound is as good as it is in our theater, especially if you have a new car because you have great speakers, right? Yeah. So you turn it on to your ra the radio station, we give you the station and you can hear it absolutely perfectly. So people oh. have loved it. So each car is spaced six feet between each car and then um, you have to stay in your car. Everybody's been bringing their dinners and I think a little, a little alcohol, but you know, we're not encouraging that because they are driving when they leave here, but it's, um, it's really been fun for people. So they're just delighted with it. We can't keep up with the demand. Now, of course, we had to shut it down because of the mandate, which is really disappointing. But um, so mm -hmm. we've moved all the people from this weekend and next weekend into what we hope will be later September. But we have yeah. over 2000 subscribers and you can imagine they are all just chomping at the bit for some sort of theater. So wow. we, we, you know, we can't even possibly mimic that. We only have 45 stalls in our parking lot. Oh, so, you're, that's limiting, yeah. yeah. So it's hard. Well, we have a lot more to talk about, but we're gonna stop for a quick break and please join us back again with Dina Dre, the executive director of the Diamond Head Theater. Aloha, I'm Lillian Cumi, host of Lillian's Vegan World, the show where we talk about veganism and the plant-based diet located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a vegan chef and cooking instructor, and I have lots of uh, information to share with you about how awesome this plant-based diet is. So do tune in every second Thursday from 1 p.m. Aloha.
Aloha and welcome back to Nonprofits Mean Business 2. I am here with Dina Dre, the Executive Director of the Diamond Head Theater. And during our break, we uh, received a question from a viewer and they are asking, do the actors practice social distancing? They absolutely do. So we have very, very meticulous social distance protocol going on for the drive-ins. Um, the actors are backstage and they're all separated by at least 10 to 12 feet. They have masks on. Um, when they walk up to the microphone, the microphone has been sanitized. Each time there's an actor at the microphone, they leave singly. They go back into the theater, which is 500 seats, and they sit far apart from each other. Um, we're really careful about that because we want people to know that we're taking care of the people that are performing for us, and that's really important. But we also want to set a standard so that when they do come back to the theater, and we can allow people in our theater again, they'll understand that we take this seriously. We really feel like it's important, even now with the drive-in, to be sure that we're being safe. Yeah, that's super important. Um, so your regular core of full-time employees was how many when you were fully operational? We, um, we had 18 and we've let go two and a half on an indefinite basis. Um, okay. And the rest right now are using a combination of vacation and working from home for the next two weeks. And then we'll um, hopefully be back. And how much time are you spending now making plans for reopening? And when I, when I say that, I mean, you know, the things that you're gonna have in place because I'm sure COVID won't just, you know, stop. You're gonna no, have to have right. some things in place. Um, are, are you planning on what your next season is going to be? Or are you going to do like the bodyguard? Are you planning to have that be maybe your first show? Kind of tell me your, how that's. Right. So we're not, unfortunately, the bodyguard has been put off indefinitely. Um, but we have a season and it's going to open in January. So we're actually actively selling right now our season subscription series, which will be um, January through August. Uh, we recognize that. We don't know what it will be like in January. We're hopeful that mm -hmm. we can put on a play. Um, it's called Steel Magnolias. We hope to put on that on at the end of January. We're thinking it might have to be socially distanced. And that was what we would do is social distance the play. And then maybe by the musical, which is Jesus Christ Superstar, at the end of March, we could actually have people sitting side by side once hopefully there's a vaccine. Um, with masks, with whatever else we need to do to get them into our theater. I'm watching what people are doing on the mainland. There's been some theaters opening um, in New England and they're taking precautions and we're gonna look at what they're doing. The best part of this is collaboration between theaters and all the theaters are trying to help each other. Nationally, from Broadway down to the smallest community theater, we all recognize we're in the same boat we need to be able to find a way to bring our art to audiences and we're copying each other's successes and we're learning from each other's mistakes. So everybody's being really careful and really cautious. And like I said, a lot of my best ideas are coming from other theaters to see what they're doing a little bit ahead of ours. So we had planned to have a Christmas show. Um, it was gonna be Elf. And we're just about ready to think that's not going to happen because that would need to start auditions in October. And we don't think that they were gonna be able to do that. Um, we need to get to a spot where the city will allow us to have even 200 in the theater because mm -hmm. we could do that socially distance with a cast and a crew and an audience. But given that we just walked away from 10, I think we have a ways to go and now we're in none. Um, so it's really, we, we have to be really flexible and nimble. We just have to keep saying, okay, we can't do that now, what can we do? Okay, we can't do that now, what can we do? And that's why the drive-ins have been such a blessing because they're successful, they're safe, people are having fun, people are remembering why they love theater. And that's all we can do right now is to remind people that they love us, that we'll be back eventually. And we all just gotta get through this. And that's the best we can do. Would you be able to do something like the, the serenade or something even on the stage where the actors were very apart that you could sell tickets for some type of online viewing you know, to we, kind of get that feeling? 
we've, we've looked at streaming and I will tell you streaming is very difficult unless you have ex really good camera work and really good professional actors. I'm not saying our actors couldn't do it, but for example, they just had a streaming version of Hamilton. It was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I'm sure it cost millions of dollars to produce. And they had to go on the stage and do a stop and go and have the actors stop and then sing a song and do a close up of their face. So you don't realize that the, all of that camera work and all of that work that goes into making the performance look real is huge. So for us to take a camera and put it up at the back of a theater and take a, a movie of our, of our play really wouldn't work. Yeah, but we're it sounds looking, like it's Right, we're looking at something. I mean, what can we do? Can we do small Zoom monologues? Can we do something creatively to piece it up and to put it together into some sort of streaming um, platform? And, and definitely we're up for anything we can try. Yeah, I can imagine. And I, I shared with you earlier that I had um, looked at some of your, your past interviews or a past interview from four years ago that was also on Think Tech. And at that time, you were talking about the need for improvements for the theater. And, you know, that was four years ago. So it sounds like you have some exciting news that you might we want are, to share. We with are. Us. We are. Um, we are actually, we're building a new theater. And it's, we've not quite gone public, public yet. So we haven't gone out and told our story and gone to the press. Uh, but everybody in town, it's the worst kept secret in the city um, because everybody kind of knows about it. We've had a lot of conversations because when you go before neighborhood board meetings and you have to explain what you're doing and when you pull permits down at the you know, Department of Planning and Permitting. So it's, it's not a secret, but we haven't quite launched it yet. We've been raising money for about five years now. Um, and we're looking at possibly breaking ground within, in the next couple of months. So and it's gonna be where, very exciting. Where will it be located? It's right next door to the current theater. So going up the hill towards Leahi Hospital. So we will keep this theater up and running and then we will move in there and then tear this theater down. We're keeping a portion of this theater, which is the very back part. That was a 1980s edition. So that still is usable and can be repurposed. So we're gonna keep that and put a new wall on it and then have a big green space where this current theater is now, which will be nice for the neighborhood. So it's gonna be nice, we're excited. Oh, that's very exciting. And how many seats will be in the new theater? It'll be about the same, about, we okay. have close to 500 now. And you know, we like that space. Well, first of all, there are two things. One, we like that space. We like people being able to come in and see their friends and their family and their neighbors. We don't wanna to get too big for our britches and suddenly be trying to fill a 750 seat hall. Um, 500 is our number. We extend, we're popular, we have full houses. We like that energy that that creates, so that's good. Um, and then the second thing is the parking lot. So we can only have 500 seats because we have 100 stalls. And the, you know, the rules are you, can, you have so many stalls, you can only have so many bodies in the theater. So that's, that's, very interesting. Um, that's kind of self-limiting. But it works for us because like I said, even if that were not the regulation, we would still keep to this amount. Where does most of your funding come from for, for things like, you know, we obviously you've had to put some money away to build a new theater. Is it from ticket sales or do you have private donors or? So it's interesting because um, ticket sales cover only about 45% of our cost. And I think a lot of people think the reverse because we're so successful and thank goodness for that. I never take it for granted, but it, it only covers about 45% because Everything else that goes on here is just like any other small business. There's infrastructure costs, there's electricity, there's insurance, there's employees. So, you know, and, and we're a small staff and hard working staff, but all of those costs add up to a lot of money. So we have education classes, we get revenue from education classes. We get the revenue from renting the theater, as I mentioned, we rent the theater when we can to other, other nonprofit groups. But the core part of being an arts organization is the money you raise. So that a lot of our revenue, probably about 40%, comes from money that we raise in the community. And surprisingly, mostly from individuals. So a lot of people think, oh, you must write grants. And don't the grants fund the theater? Well, no, they don't. Because grants like primarily like to fund 
things that aren't ongoing. You know, an ongoing operations of a theater is not something that a foundation typically would fund. So that's why we ask individuals to support us. And it's been super successful. People are very generous to our theater. And we're so that's, lucky because that's yeah. allowing us now to move forward and survive this. So we've been, we've been very, very grateful for that. Because I'm sure there's still operating costs, even with the theater being closed, there's still maintenance and you've got to keep up with cleaning. Oh, sure. And, and, and we're, we want to keep, we want to keep our employees covered with their health costs, health costs. So right. we're paying their insurance. And like I said, for this two weeks, they're on vacation and they're working from home. So that's still money going out to salaries. Um, so yeah, we're, 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 you know, this coming year in September is going to be very tight. Um, we survived last year because a lot of people donated back their season subscription tickets. Um, mm -hmm. So we ended the year doing fine. Now, September 1st, we start over. And this is going to be, we're going to be hanging by our fingernails here for a while. And like you said, it's not like there's going to be a light switch and people are going to suddenly come rushing back to the theater and it's going to be business as usual. It's going to take us a couple of years to get back to where we left off, I think. so. Right. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you. I feel like we kind of got a sneak preview, your first press kind yeah, of, uh, right. with about the new theater. So that's amazing. And I can't thank you enough for your time and sharing with us um, how you're getting through this and some of your plans and wish you all the best and look forward to coming to the theater. Thank, thank you. you. So much, Dina. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Nonprofits Mean Business 2. Aloha.